I, I graduated too early, or I was unable to fulfill all the requirements for the Humbio, uh, Humbio um, degree. I was in the class of 71, and a number of people in 72 and 73 could read the requirements. It would have taken me another year. Um, so I did as much Humbio as I possibly could, and I was definitely, uh, I, I caught the virus, as we like to say. I was totally persuaded of Humbio's message. Um, uh, but what happened was that uh, I was a bio major, and I was heavily influenced by Earth Day, the original Earth Day, the events leading up to it. I participated in White Plaza. Uh, together with some friends, we did a demonstration that phosphorus-containing um, detergents um, were not necessarily a lot better than just good old-fashioned soap at cleaning things but that we went on then to talk about the consequence of so much phosphate in the water and the eutrophication of lakes and bogs and so on. There were a couple of us who were interested in smog, in air pollution. And another uh, student named Skip Harris had written a paper in which he proposed that um, student health would be a very sensitive indicator of air pollution. If students' health is being affected by air pollution, just think about other segments of the population. Students are younger, active, tend to be uh, healthy. Um, they're built in controls. They're usually concentrated in space and time. So there are lots of advantages for study. And what Skip Harris did was his proposal resonated well with me. Um, it said, look, we won't find, it, and a study of students would not generate the most extreme examples of response to air pollution, of respiratory illness and so on. But what it would do is it would give you a conservative measure that most people would be affected at least as much as this healthy group of younger students collected in one area exposed to uh, fairly uh, uniform conditions of air pollution. And the other advantage that studying students had is that it allowed the ability to do controls for weather. Weather confounds any study of respiratory illnesses and so on. To make a long story short, so I spent a summer putting together an outline of the study and then I did. I wrote a proposal to the National Science Foundation but I thought this was a little bit crazy. I mean, here's an undergraduate proposing to the U.S. National Science Foundation to use taxpayers' money for a study, uh, a student studying other students. What was interesting is that the timing was right, I see in retrospect. NSF was interested in uh, science focused on public concerns, public issues. They were interested also in uh, the upswell of student interest in learning science and applying science and doing science a little differently like human biology at Stanford was showing. Well, NSF uh, jumped all over that. They gave me the award and then they invited me back six months later to say, you know, is this working? Were you are you able to do what you said you were going to do? Did you get the health centers to cooperate? Could you collect the quantitative data? Can you do the analysis? How can you do all of this? Well, I was overwhelmed by it uh, very early, even in that summer when I was planning it, and I realized that I would need the help of many other players. Fortunately, Don Kennedy had invited me once to a planning session for Humbio, which was uh, early in the planning stages, in which people were talking about how would Humbio be more hands-on and not just in libraries and laboratories. How would it really interface with the world? And the idea of the workshops was foremost. The, the people would, in, would do a workshop, some kind of endeavor in the world. You, you would be an intern, you would work in a company, you would do some kind of a research project, and those were loosely being called workshops. So I said, wow, I could take this idea of mine that's way too big for me. I could focus on a key part that I'm excited about, which is air pollution and student health records. But other students could work on the challenging questions of how do you do time lags. If today's pollution triggers a response three days from now, how are we going to find that in the data? And how are we going to check consistently and allow the time lag to vary from one day to five days to a week? Maybe it's 10 days. So maybe today's smog episode, 10 days from now, causes everybody to feel terrible and choke up in their throats, and maybe there's a big time lag. There was a place for folks doing stat, statistical analysis, and computer work. Remember, in those days, um, 
a lot of these things required writing your own program. So I had a team of students, and we all worked together. We had daily meetings and weekly meetings. Daily meetings of a kind of a smaller group and weekly meetings of everybody. Students were working on the psychology of student response to, to air pollution. People were working on the figuring out this time lag methodology. People were working on um, many different aspects of, um, some were studying the physiology. Well, how is it that ozone causes a perturbation in your throat, causes the irritation that it would lead you to the health center? Others were looking at, you know, what is it about um, who, who shows up at a health center and who says, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to go. What are the, what are the barriers? Uh, the motivational barriers. So we had all kinds of interesting related studies going on at the same time. And I, I learned early on how valuable all of that was, even though it wasn't going to affect necessarily my own findings. Um, but I realized how important the team was. And uh, so this was the first human biology workshop. Many, many, many things went our way, and I remember the day you sort of took all those cards over and you read them all through and you had your program written and out came you know, the first results. Darn, if we weren't so disappointed. There were so few correlations. There were so few. Working with students has many benefits with fellow students, but it also has a few disadvantages. <laughs> I think we all understood what we were trying to do with the time lag, but it had come out in the computer program as time forward. So we were asking, in effect, if today is a day in which a lot of students report ill health at the health center, what is the air pollution like three days from now? It was. It was a plus sign when it should have been a minus sign for the time lag. You put it through the other way around, the same pile of printout, and it was flush with interesting findings. And I went on to get my honors thesis and, and eventually to publish a paper in the Archives of Environmental Health, which was for an undergraduate at that time was pretty was pretty remarkable. It was turned down a lot of more prestigious places, but you know, the point was that um, we were able to do this project. It was the first workshop in Humbayo. It brought together a lot of students in a meaningful research project, and I think we made good on the, on the taxpayer's dollar. I mean, we showed people something, a finding, for one of the healthiest populations that there was a, an effect of air pollution on everyday health in student populations. NSF invited me to come to Washington and to meet with all of these very important people in the funding of science and the National Science Foundation. Fortunately, I didn't know who they were. I was just a student walking in, and they grilled me. How did I put this together? How did this work? How did I do the accountability? Who held the money? How were checks written? How did I pay people for services? How did I deal with ethical issues? How did I do this? How did I do and what was so marvelous was that the combination of faculty advisors and very supportive department staff had helped me with all of those interesting questions. And NSF was persuaded that student work could be possible. So believe it or not, they started SOS, Student Originated Studies. And for a period of at least 10 years, they funded sometimes as many as, you know, I mean, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars of student-originated studies funded by the National Science Foundation, um, uh, which we were just one of the pioneers, but I think they were proud of the fact that we were able to return results that were influential and published. Uh, I was young. I think I was the youngest assistant professor on campus, and this was my, you know, big debut in Humbayo. I was a coming home anyway. I was a coming home for me anyway, because I had taken Humbayo 1 the first time it was given. And uh, gosh, there were 470 people in that room, and it was uh, when I took Humbayo 1. So it was a big deal for me to come and do my first Humbayo lecture. Moreover, some of the really great figures in Humbayo, Al Hastorf, Sandy Dornbush, Merton Burnfield, told me they were going to come and hear my lecture and give me comments on it. So I was like doubly nervous. I was nervous because it was the first lecture, and then I was nervous because they were going to be there. Well, I unfortunately sped through the lecture <laughs> at a ridiculous pace and, um, and got through the end. It was about the evolution of adult lactose tolerance, a topic I still speak on today, but pace it quite differently. I rushed through the lecture. Um, obviously too fast. It felt uncomfortably fast to everybody, including me, and a hand went up at the end of the lecture. 
and I called in the person, and the person said, Professor Durham, would you repeat that, please? <laughs> <laughs> and we all had a good laugh, and then I could relax, and then the next day I did much better. I was in that classroom when Colin Pittendrick did the bromeliads and talked about malaria in Trinidad and gave that whole, as you say, it's, it is a story, but it's a scientific detective story, and it's guided by specific hypotheses that, as the Army Corps of Engineers investigated that example, they were able to test. And I actually tried to do the very same thing with lactose. Now, I don't have bromeliads coming down out of the ceiling, and I don't have, you know, the intrigue of, um, you know, that's a, a sort of the intrigue of the wartime setting, and there's this problem with malaria, and it's being traced to agricultural origins and so on. So I don't have the, the sort of wartime army intrigue about it. Um, on the other hand, it has a storyline. Most definitely there's a storyline. And like you say, it becomes a very complicated uh, interactive story. But um, I still remain true to the sort of the humbio message that I acquired as a student was that we need to test. It's not enough to make hypotheses and offer them as possible explanation. We need also to test them. We need to put them out there and say, I could venture this as an explanation, but does it hold up against the data? I definitely do that. I like it because, um, as you say, uh, it encourages people to think that they can go out and work on problems and that they can, in due course, with help, master the skills to work on the problems, um, work as part of a team on an interdisciplinary problem or whatever. So I like that because it encourages people to think that they can go out and work on problems and make a difference. I also like it uh, because it, uh, the story point you were talking about earlier, it makes a compelling, interesting story. It motivates the learning of dry material. It motivates the learn. I could give a lecture on the scientific method, and it would be so boring. But if, in the middle of understanding lactose, I say, ah, look where we are. We have three hypotheses on the table. We've got a set of data. Which one lasts, outlasts the test? The students say, oh, we just did, we just did a unit on the scientific method, and look how interesting it was. The way I operate is you find an interesting phenomenon or collection of phenomena. And rather than a method, I have never sat on one horse of methodology. I like a whole stable. And what I've tried to do is to take interesting problems. Uh, you know, I draw on a, a small set of skills and a small set of procedures um, that come out of ecology and evolution, and I, I just think it's a nice, that, that's my stable, you know, and it's not like it's a huge stable, and it's not like it makes you a jack of all trades, but it gives you a very specific kind of race that you can run. Mm -hmm. um, the phenomenon, Carlos, you refer to, I think of as opposition, where uh, people continue to do things for cultural reasons, sometimes for very good cultural reasons, very convincing old cultural reason that in a current context or climate or setting um, now begin to erode their state of adaptedness, their ability to survive and reproduce. And when they're an antithesis, when a cultural tradition persists that causes you to suffer lower survival and reproduction than you would otherwise enjoy, then obviously culture is causing um, uh, uh, an opposition to your biological interests. What I find so wonderful and so intriguing about the climate change issue of our day is it's an exactly one of these. It's an exactly a case where continuing to do business as usual, where expending the energy we expend, generating the carbon footprints we create, by continuing to change the atmospheric concentration of carbon and other uh, green carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. We're creating a situation in which we believe already uh, the planet is telling us there are negative effects, but we also think that human livelihood, survival, and reproduction is already endangered in some places by illnesses that are on the increase, the spread of malaria in certain areas. Um, but even that much more serious threats of sea level rise, of changing land areas, of 
Um, wars over resources. Wars over resources. Many, many different scenarios. What's interesting to me is that this, I don't want to make it sound oversimplified, but it is a case of opposition. It's a case where uh, a, culture, a set of values of the past, industrial production, agricultural production, and so on, um, took for granted some of the system, some of the services of the planet Earth, and generated these excess production of greenhouse excess production of greenhouse gases that has modified the climate. What's interesting is we're, you know, using very elaborate methods today to detect those changes, to measure the changing concentration of greenhouse gases, to measure the changing temperature of the earth, to measure the changing impact on everything from, you know, glaciers to polar ice caps to river flow and ice melt and all kinds of interesting things. And um, and furthermore, we're now interested in this wonderful science of trying to change human behavior in time, to change those patterns, to change those cultural traditions that generated all of the greenhouse gases, to do it in time so that there's a, a sustainable future. To me, this looks like, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a marvelous case of, the, uh, of, can, uh, of how um, human beings respond to an oppositional situation. We've set something up that's caused um, backfires against our ability to survive and reproduce. Can we organize ourselves? Can we measure the phenomena? Can we dis take a, decide on a course of action? Do we have the political and social institutions in place to respond? And can we turn this around um, and make and provide a more um, a more beneficial cultural future for ourselves than? was going to be generated by the old cultural norms of the past. So to, it looks to me like an interesting co-evolutionary problem. The, the study of climate change, the phenomenon itself looks like opposition, and the human response, the social, cultural, and, and institutional response has all the properties of being an intriguing and wonderful case. Uh, let's hope that, you know, 100 years from now, well, somebody can write co-evolution and use that example. Aside from the geophysical sciences of measurement and understanding the problem and its many repercussions, um, the call of climate change is a call for uh, evolving cultural system, appropriate cultural systems of response for sustainability. And so it looks to me like a really classic case of coevolution in our lifetime.